And now, the main event. Uh, it is my privilege to introduce um, the keynote speaker, Nancy Lynch. Uh, Nancy is the NEC Professor of Software and, and, and Software Science and Engineering at MIT. Uh, she is a pioneer in the field of distributed computing, and she developed uh, a series of distinguished results that made substantial impact on the theory and practice of distributed computing. Perhaps the best example is her 1985 work with <coughs> Fisher and Patterson, on the impossibility of distributed consensus. This result has been guiding researchers and practitioners to formulate models of computation that enable the development of realistic algorithms. Another one <laughs> is her 1988 work with uh, Dwork and Stockmeyer on consensus in the presence of partial synchrony. This work laid the foundation for the Paxos family of algorithms. Nancy is an author of over 300 research articles and several books and her book on distributed algorithms today serves as a standard reference. Nancy is a fellow of ACM, a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Sciences, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Among her awards are the Dijkstra Prize twice, the Van Wingarten Award, the Knuth Prize, the Peoria Award, the Athena Lecturer Award. She has supervised over 30 PhD students and numerous master's students and postdocs. Nancy's research is very broad and it spans distributed computing, real-time algorithms, lower bounds, formal modeling, verification, and wireless network algorithms. In her lecture today, Nancy will talk about her recent work on biological distributed algorithms, insect colonies, and brain networks. Let us um, thank um, and welcome Nancy for her presentation. But of course, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't see anybody. Nobody has their camera on. Oh, well. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead. Um, so I'm talking about the area of biological distributed algorithms. So what's that? Biological systems, as you probably know, behave like distributed algorithms in many ways. Um, they consist of many components that interact to accomplish something. Um, and good examples are insect colonies, which solve problems like searching uh, for food, say, task allocation, uh, making decisions, uh, estimation. Uh, neurons in the brain cooperate to make decisions and to represent and learn concepts. Uh, cells in uh, developing organisms organize themselves into meaningful patterns. Um, these are special kinds of distributed algorithms in that the agents use very simple communication. They have simple state, they follow simple rules. However, uh, these systems are noisy and subject to a great deal of uncertainty. So they can only solve problems approximately and probabilistically. Um, but what you get from this is that you get algorithms that are flexible, they work in different environments, they're robust to failures, and they're adaptive to changes during operation. So these are important properties, not just for biological algorithms, but I would claim also for engineered distributed algorithms, especially uh, wireless communication protocols, robot swarms, uh, neural network algorithms for machine learning. Um, so the, the question for the area is how can distributed algorithms help in understanding the behavior of biological systems? And on the other hand, how can understanding how biological systems work help us to design better uh, distributed algorithms? And by better here, I mean more robust, flexible, et cetera. Okay, so our work in this area uh, has covered uh, basically three topics. Uh, insect colonies, brain networks, and a little dabbling uh, into developmental bio. Uh, so I'll just briefly mention what we've done in brain algorithms and developmental bio. Uh, in brain algorithms, we've um, designed a, a nice distributed computing style model. <clears throat> it's a synchronous model, and but it's stochastic. It's called spiking neural networks. And we've developed a basic model and some variations. Uh, problems that we've considered are uh, winner take all, which is commonly studied in neuroscience, uh, but for distributed computing people, it's basically a leader election or focus of attention problem. And there's extensions of that to K winner take all, where you try to select uh, the K best choices. Uh, and then there's problems of implementing associative memory 
uh, detecting similarity, uh, data compression, clustering, short-term memory in some of our work. And um, also uh, more recently, we've studied uh, problems of representation and learning for hierarchically structured concepts, uh, which comes from uh, both computer vision and um, actual neural vision. Uh, we've studied the behavior of parts of the visual system in some detail. And we have um, theoretical papers on compositional style modeling of brain algorithms, uh, analysis of learning rules. Um, and we've even uh, worked with hardware people who are building spiking neural networks in hardware uh, using nanowires. Um, so our models uh, and algorithms um, provide a foundation for their work and test cases for their implementations. Uh, currently, we're looking at um, representation uh, separately from learning the representations. I think that's a, a good way to think about this area. Uh, we focus on how concepts are represented in the brain and how the representations get used, uh, and also separately how they are learned. But the themes that keep recurring are themes of uh, uh, tolerating noise and uncertainty, but we're also interested in building networks uh, as we do in distributed computing theory using composition and also levels of abstraction. Okay, very briefly in developmental biology, there's a problem called the French flag problem, uh, which originated from uh, Wolpert way back in 1969. Uh, it's about uh, how tissues form in a scale invariant way as organisms develop. Um, so it, the basic uh, uh, approach is that cells determine their type uh, when they're differentiating themselves uh, based on where they are. And they get this positional information from graded chemical signals uh, called morphogen gradients. This uh, also was studied by uh, Turing. Uh, and in our approach, we just modeled the cells as agents. And initially, they don't have any colors but they have to choose one of uh, three colors or more colors uh, for, uh, uh, to configure themselves into a flag. We use a model where um, the morphogens, the chemical morphogens are released by external sources and the agents are able to measure uh, morphogen concentrations. And this is biorealistic. And we get some simple impossibility results and simple algorithms. Okay, but this talk today is actually about insect colony algorithms. Uh, what we've studied in this area, and I'm just going to give a, you know, a brief overview of several of these topics and then focus on house hunting. So we uh, studied the foraging problem, which is a problem of uh, searching in the distributed system, uh, population density uh, estimation, um, task allocation, and um, house hunting. Now, what that means is uh, a colony, an insect colony is going to find and agree on and relocate to a new nest. So it's basically um, a geographical uh, distributed consensus problem. Okay, foraging, I'm, I'm going to make these slides available. So I'm just going to put up some of the main references. Uh, this is a distributed searching problem. It was mainly studied by Mira Radeva uh, with Christoph uh, Lenson, Calvin Newport. And it's, um, this is in uh, Mira Radeva's thesis along with several of these other uh, problems. <clears throat> For population density estimation, I'll say a little bit more about that today um, because I'm going to use it later on uh, in um, talking about house hunting. So let's uh, take a look at that. For density estimation, uh, in reality, uh, ants use estimates of colony density, uh, which is something like the ants per unit area, to solve several problems. Examples here are in house hunting. Ants are going to commit to a nest when they detect that the density of ants in the nest have become, has become sufficiently high. So this is like a quorum. When you reach a quorum, assuming that they know approximately the area of the nest, they can figure out uh, how many ants are there approximately uh, from uh, looking at the density. Uh, but you know they, they can also make decisions like, should they engage another colony of ants or retreat based on how many ants they detect in their own colony versus the enemy colony, they can tell the difference. Um, in task allocation, they can choose tasks based on uh, the densities of ants that are already performing the various tasks. 
Uh, so it's pretty well known now that ants estimate the density based on their rates of encounters of other ants. And so we just looked at uh, how this might work as a formal algorithm and analyzed how accurate the estimates are. So very briefly, um, our, in our density estimation algorithm, uh, ants are wandering in a two-dimensional plane uh, using independent random walks. Uh, each ant counts its number of encounters per unit time and converts that to a density estimate. Um, so this is uh, just as a side point, this assumes the ant can count its number of encounters, but ants of course really can't count precisely, but the algorithm doesn't really rely on uh, this being exact. Okay, so we, we look at a model where space is discretized as a, a it's actually a, a wraparound a torus grid. Uh, the ants walk around the nodes, um, there's the torus. And we discretize time as well into synchronous rounds just because it's convenient for formal modeling. I don't really think it makes a lot of difference in terms of uh, correspondence to reality. Okay, so the algorithm is just in every round, each ant takes a step in a uniformly randomly chosen direction, adds the number of ants it encounters in the new location to a running count. And after every number of rounds, it outputs the value of the ratio count divided by the number of rounds. Okay, so you get a theorem that says the expected value of the ant's estimate is correct. It's equal to the actual density. And you can also get a high probability theorem with a concentration bound. The high probability says that the estimate is correct to within some epsilon, provided the number of rounds is at least a certain constant times a function that uh, uses epsilon. Okay. Okay, so that's the theorem. Um, and, and just as a technical point, this works even though the torus grid graph has very slow, has slow mixing time. There's a strong correlation between successive locations for an ant. So uh, to make that concrete, when an ant AI encounters another ant AJ, it's very likely to encounter it again in the following rounds but you can bound that. There's a recollision bound that says, if um, AI and AJ uh, collide in a round, the probability they collide again <clears throat> M rounds later is approximately one over M plus one plus um, one over A. The, the estimate would be just one over A. That's ideal if anybody could go anywhere at any round as, if, uh, as in a complete graph. But for a graph like the grid, this uh, one over A, um, uh, gets modified, uh, but the influence, as you can see from the first term, uh, decreases with time. Okay, so then we did a lot of work on uh, task allocation, which I won't say anything about, but we'll leave you with some nice references to look at our work in this area. I'll just note that we did this in um, conjunction with Anna Dornhaus, uh, who's a, a insect biologist. Um, and I'll move right to our work on house hunting now. Okay. So this is uh, work that we've done over several years. It involves um, uh, quite a number of students and collaborators. Okay, so what I'll do here is uh, just tell you a little bit about how the uh, ant house hunting algorithm really works. And then we'll review some of our older work, which is based on a simple theoretical model. Um, this is in Mira Radeva's thesis. We get a lower bound and fast and robust algorithms. Um, but then the more recent work that I'll focus on in uh, the second half of the talk uh, it is based on a much more uh, realistic model of how the ant colony behavior. And this started with simulation results and then we have been trying to move on to getting actual analysis results for this much more realistic model. Okay. Okay. So uh, in the, the real ant algorithm, so, um, <clears throat> okay, so what happens? Uh, the particular type of ants that we've focused on here is temnothorax ants or rock ants. They live in little rock uh, crevices. They're extremely tiny. Um, the nests can get destroyed by flooding or some, something dislodges the rocks. And then the ants have to find a new nest and they have to move the entire colony there. So this house hunting process is very distributed. There's no uh, one ant in charge. 
Um, and there's a little flow chart here that just uh, indicates how biologists think of this house hunting process. So um, basically, they move around searching for new sites. That's kind of a random walk. Uh, when they find sites, uh, they assess them for their quality. And if they like the site, uh, they start trying to recruit other ants to go to the same site. And they do this with uh, a process called tandem running. And you can see a picture of it here where you have one ant actually trying to persuade another one to follow her uh, to the, um, the nest. When they do that, the new ant, um, the second ant also evaluates the nest independently. So it's a kind of a slow process. But after a while, uh, if a nest acquires sufficiently many uh, ants uh, to um, uh, constitute a quorum, then they move into an entirely different phase where now they go and carry uh, other ants uh, to the nest. They've decided this is the, the right nest and, and they're just going to go and, and carry other ants there and they carry the queen and they carry all the, uh, the brood, which is, you know, the pre-ants unhatched. Okay. Um, so here's just some references for later. People who've worked on this um, house hunting algorithm in uh, the uh, insect biology community. So Stephen Pratt is our collaborator on our newer work. Okay, so our, our older work uh, started with, um, you know, theoreticians approach, a very simple model. And this was um, mainly work by Mira Radeva uh, with uh, collaborators. So the main results here I'll summarize are a lower bound on the time to agree on a new nest. Um, and then uh, we tried to get an algorithm that would match the lower bound, typical of work in distributed computing theory. And we got such an algorithm that matches the, the lower bound, but it's not really a great algorithm because it's not ant-like, but the problem was that it's not robust to inexact estimates of the nest populations. So um, we came up with a second algorithm, which uh, has a slightly worse time bound, but that's not the issue here. This is a more realistic algorithm, which is actually robust to inexact estimates of the number of the density of ants, the, the nest populations. Now you can do things like compose uh, this second algorithm, uh, which uses inexact estimates with our uh, density estimation algorithm, which gives you the inexact uh, estimates. Okay, so this, these are slides I uh, borrowed from Mira Rudeva uh, to illustrate the, the simplified model. So suppose you have N identical ants starting at some home nest. Um, there's K uh, candidate new nests, each one with, um, she used a simple binary quality indicator. It's a good nest or a bad nest. Uh, it operates in synchronous rounds where in each round an ant can do one of the following three things. It can search for a new nest. And we'll assume that since it's working uh, randomly and we're not really modeling the distances, that it has uniform probability one over K of choosing any nest. It can revisit a previously visited nest at any time. It can just decide to do that without random walking. We assume it remembers. Um, and it can recruit another ant, uh, which is chosen randomly uh, to a previously visited nest. Okay, so that's a simple model of the process. This is repeating it again. Okay, so when an ant is at a nest, we assume that it can determine exactly the number of ants that are in that nest. Okay, and the goal of the problem, of course, is to wind up with all of the ants in one nest, and it should be one of the good nests. Okay, so we get a theorem that says, uh, this is the lower bound, if you have any algorithm that solves the house hunting problem in T rounds with high probability, then the number of rounds T has to be of order at least log N. And the proof idea here just basically depends on a key lemma that says that look at any round, look at any particular ant that it doesn't know, hasn't yet visited the winning nest. Uh, so you say that ant is ignorant at the beginning of the round, 
with probability at least a quarter, it remains ignorant by the end of the route. And then we can just use a simple turnoff bound uh, to get the result for multiple lamps. So the first algorithm, which, as I said, um, assumes that you can count uh, the number of ants in a nest exactly. Uh, the algorithm is all the ants go searching for a nest. Every ant that finds a good nest starts trying to recruit. And it continues recruiting as long as the nest population keeps uh, increasing. An ant that initially found a bad nest would just give up at the beginning and be available to get recruited. Okay, so uh, turns out that with high probability that yields one candidate nest after order log k rounds, uh, and then the remaining ants who haven't yet uh, learned about or reached that nest get recruited uh, to the winning nest. Okay, so that's where you get the, uh, the log n for the rest of the ants. Okay. So the theorem says it, it solves the house hunting problem within this time with high probability. But uh, this isn't robust, it's not satisfactory because this isn't robust to even slightly inaccurate estimates of nest populations. So it, it's not like what the ants would do. <clears throat> you can see that it's fragile because it just depends on whether an ant detects a decrease in the population of a nest. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here's the robust algorithm. Now um, the ants go searching for a new nest, and if they happen to uh, find uh, a, a good nest uh, first, what they do is then forever, they keep recruiting, but with different probabilities. And the probability depends on the detected nest population. Okay, so it recruits with a probability that is higher, the more ants, uh, are found in the nest. Okay, so now the theorem might not look as exciting to distributed algorithms people because the bound is worse. It solves the house hunting problem within this time with high probability, but uh, this algorithm is robust to inaccurate estimates, not too inaccurate, but slightly inaccurate estimates of nest populations. And it also seems more like what the ants might do if they take into account uh, the uh, influence of uh, other ants in deciding that a nest is good. But to formulate the robustness guarantee, you have to be careful. Um, you want to get the idea of approximate nest population estimates. So that you can quantify that with an epsilon. The first thing you might think of, uh, first thing we thought of is, okay, the counts in the nest can be anything in a range around the correct number. One minus epsilon times the correct number to one plus epsilon times the correct number. Okay, well, that's reasonable. We use this kind of approximation in, in many algorithms. That doesn't work because essentially you've given an adversary the power to control where the returned count lies in the interval. So uh, it turns out if you have two nests, an adversary can keep the populations roughly equal for a long time with high probability just by. Um, tweaking where it is, where, where the um, uh, estimate lies in this, uh, this range. So that, of course, delays breaking the symmetry. OK, so then the second attempt, this is a simple idea, uh, make the adversary not worst case, but stochastic. Uh, so now the count of the ants in a nest is determined by, and this is like oblivious. It's a probability distribution. It's not controlled by an adversary. Uh, it's determined by a probability distribution with mean uh, C and um, high probability that the result is in this range. And this even allows correlations for different ants. But the adversary can't uh, act in a worst case way. It's just going to have to, uh, you just get a probability distribution controlling uh, where you are. So here's the probability distribution. And with high probability, you're within the right interval. Now, with, with this kind of uh, uh, choice of uh, population estimates, you do get the house hunting problem um, within time uh, given by this bound uh, that depends on epsilon. OK. So all right. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any, any questions so far. 
um, the rest of this part is just, okay, so maybe it's obvious now, we have a simple robust algorithm for house hunting. Uh, it's robust in that ants can determine the nest populations, um, but they tolerate inexact estimates of these populations. And then remember, we also have this density estimation algorithm that yields pretty good estimates of the density or populations. So now, uh, can you compose these algorithms? Turns out you can. You can get an overall robust house hunting algorithm in which the ants don't have any information about the nest populations, but have to compute it. And they do it with this uh, density estimation algorithm. Okay, so basically you compose the two algorithms by running the main algorithm for house hunting. And every time the ants have to determine uh, the population of a nest, they use an instance of the density estimation to give the ants their counts. Okay, so uh, worked out carefully, the density estimation algorithm ensures that the ants get the estimates, get estimates that satisfy the requirements of the robust algorithm. Okay, and that uh, is enough to yield our uh, combined theorem. Algorithm two combined with density estimation solves the problem within this bound. Uh, with high probability. Okay. Questions about this part? This is our work up until a few years ago. Okay, so we talked about our work as theoreticians. We started by making a simple model. Question, Mike? Uh, yes. Uh, um, for, for the house hunting problem, if the, if, if the desirable nests are not are, are not known. You you don't have the yes or no answer that this is a good nest, and 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 the the ants are only trying to 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 choose one of the nests to end up in. Uh, that seems like a much harder problem. Do, do your algorithm have you considered that? And do your algorithms generalize at all? Yes, that yes. Uh, in this theore early theoretical model, we have simplified all over the place, and you know the nests were either good or bad, and the good ones are all equal. So yeah, that's, that's kind of a hard problem because uh, there's nothing to distinguish them or skew it toward one nest versus another one. So maybe that would make it take longer. But we didn't know. I mean, we, we weren't sure what the impact would be of having different quality estimates. And we didn't know how to set up a theoretical model that would let us analyze this. So we went to the other extreme, which is the part I'm gonna talk about next. And Gave a, worked with the insect biology people and came up with a full, full model for actual ant colonies. Good, thank you. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to now move completely to a realistic model for which, um, as you might expect, uh, initially we're only able to get simulation results, but we got a lot of simulation results. Um, and then we're, we've been trying since then to uh, pick this apart, figure out what are the key uh, observations and actually try to prove them. And this requires some simplification. Okay. Okay, it says on my screen, the host has spotlighted my video for everyone. I, that's a mechanical thing, Zoom thing, I guess. Okay, um, all right. So I'll talk about the realistic model, the work we've done over the past two years and very recent work on trying to analyze that. Okay, so, okay. The model that we used in the, these earlier papers was quite simplified. So then we thought, well, let's try to get a real uh, model, a complete model for uh, the algorithm and try to figure out whether that would match observed behavior of actual ant colonies, um, and then whether we could analyze it. Okay, so try to develop a complete, we called it a holistic model for the entire house hunting process. So we wanna simulate it first, compare its behavior with the actual insect colonies uh, from biological experiments. And this is a validation phase and iterate this until we think we actually have captured the behavior of real ant colonies. I mean, this is, I should um, emphasize, this is one particular species of ants, there's variations on this process and other species, but we looked at the research on one particular species, Temnothorax. Okay, then 
try to analyze properties of the model's behavior. As you can imagine, this is again going to require some abstraction and simplification, and there's an art to trying to retain key aspects. Okay, so uh, for the realistic model, I'm referring to two very recent papers. Uh, we put a paper on BioArchive describing all our results. We gave a summary in uh, BDA this year, and we just got uh, the full version of the paper. Uh, accepted to the Journal of Computational Biology. Um, this is, you notice there's a change in title reflecting the focus on one particular finding rather than just, you know, try to experiment with everything. Okay. So, all right, some background here, uh, a bunch of papers with experimental studies of the house hunting procedure. Uh, what people did was study the impact of the nest qualities uh, study the use of quorums, uh, study the success of, in, study what was done by individual behavior strategies versus uh, what involved collective decisions, uh, studied how the colonies um, resolve splits because sometimes the colony can uh, divide up into more than one nest. Uh, how often does that occur and how does that get resolved? Those, um, fair amount of previous modeling, it's very detailed modeling and quantitative simulation results. So uh, here's the, the main previous model that we focused on. This was by Stephen Pratt, uh, Sumter collaborators and students. Um, so this diagram, which I don't really expect you to see the details of, describes the behavior of an individual ant moving from phase, from state to state of, uh, in, in uh, this process very detailed, so obviously is not gonna be very tractable for analysis. So we wanted something that was a little more um, abstract, um, still biorealistic, but potentially analyzable. Okay, so here's something a little bit simpler. <coughs> the diagram uh, still describes the behavior of an individual ant. It's a little bit simpler than the previous uh, model. It has uh, somewhat fewer parameters, but this is just um, a model for one ant. We also want a distributed algorithm model that describes how all the ants together uh, behave. So we need a real you know, model for uh, concurrent operation. So, okay, our execution model was, is that the ant system operates in synchronous rounds, a simplification, but that doesn't seem very important. Uh, in each round, each ant gets a chance to perform a state transition. Now, we can't just say let all the ants perform their transitions concurrently because there's a lot of interaction. Some of the transitions have some environmental side effects, like uh, an ant moving between nests, and that can be, uh, impact the behavior of the other ants. And some of the transitions involve uh, multiple ants, pairs of ants for recruiting and following and transporting. So we have, a, it's a little bit messy, but uh, we have a, a model that at each round, we have a random permutation of the ants in order to give them turns uh, to take a step. Um, and this is actually based on how we uh, designed the model in the earlier papers as well. You have a sequential execution. Um, so each ant in this uh, sequence gets a turn, but if the transition happens to involve another ant, you just count that as the rounds transition for both of the ants, okay? So another thing to note is this state transition diagram actually doesn't have all the information that you need to understand what a single ant is doing. Um, you need to also say what the ant, what is in the state of the ant? What does the ant remember, for example? So we have to describe what the ant's state components are and describe uh, the enabling and the effects of the transitions precisely in terms of the state components. So we ended up dividing each ant state into two parts, which we call the external state. That's basically something about the ant that's visible to other ants. Here, it's just where it is, its current nest. And an internal state, which is the ant can remember some limited number of nests and their qualities. 
Okay, and the transitions, which you can't tell from this diagram, are actually probabilistic. <clears throat> okay, so this is just a comparison of our model. Um, it would be complicated to describe all the possibilities uh, because we have many agents. So I'm just going to, in this discussion, focus on the most common path that an active ant will take to move forward in emigrations. I'm saying active ants here because there's actually three types of ants in a colony, the active ones, the ones that wind up being passive, just carried, and the, um, the babies, the brood items. So it's only the active ants that go through these transitions. Okay, the passive ants and the brood items just wait to be transported. So I guess I already said this four distinct phases for an active worker in the house hunting process. In the exploration phase, the ant randomly explores looking for a suitable new nest. Uh, if she finds one, she goes into the assessment phase and evaluates the nest quality if she likes it. She enters the canvassing phase to recruit other ants to the nest using tandem runs. Um, but before she starts each tandem run, she evaluates the nest population and compares that to a quorum threshold, which is another parameter of the model. If the population is less than the quorum threshold, she goes ahead to lead the tandem run. On the other hand, if she sees the population has reached the threshold, she switches mode to the transport phase, where now she recruits to the nest by physically carrying the new ants instead of doing tandem running. Okay, um, so that's basically how it works. Okay, what about the probabilistic transition? So an ant's decision to move forward through the phases is mainly probabilistic. Um, the exception is when it detects a quorum and it just switches, but otherwise uh, the decisions to uh, do all the other transitions is probabilistic. And we model that with a sigmoid function of the quality of the nest. Okay, so we have a probability of taking a transition based on a function um, with two parameters. One is the quality of the nest, that's X. And the other one is just a steepness parameter. If you have a high value of this lambda uh, steepness parameter, you get a steeper curve and that corresponds to lower noise levels. So we could vary the noise level. Okay. Oh, question so far about the, uh, just the way the model is set up. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into what we did with it. No questions? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so once we had this model, um, we, which means uh, Jia Jia Zhao, uh, who did her master's thesis, on this, uh, simulated the model extensively uh, using her Python-based simulator, which is actually available on GitHub. And some other people have used it already. Um, and it could be modified without too much trouble to consider variations on the model. Uh, maybe other questions besides the house hunting question. Um, I mean, other questions about house hunting and other, other uh, algorithms besides house, besides house hunting. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> for validation, what we did was compare the behavior to experimental results. And this is work by Pratt and Sumter, um, where they studied uh, single nest emigrations, distributions across ants of certain key behaviors like the number of recruitment acts, the number of ants involved in each type of recruitment, things like that. And then they went on to study two nest emigrations <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, the prevalence of splits. Then they looked at uh, two unequal nests and figured out speed, accuracy, trade-off. So there's a lot of information in these papers. And we went through and compared with um, practically everything. The simulation results, uh, I mean, this is an interactive process uh, modifying the, the model, but the simulation results uh, turned out to be generally consistent with the experimental results. So this is, there's just a couple of slides here, uh, sample uh, charts that show the consistency here. So here's a histogram that shows the workers that are grouped by the number of recruitment acts performed, um, how many ants uh, perform different uh, numbers of recruitment acts. And you have the empirical results from um, one of the papers 
and our simulation results. And there they turn out to be pretty close. Okay. So the point of all this is just to show that the model correctly captures the behavior of real ants, which made us confident that we had built an actual ant colony. Here's another example, a histogram of workers who perform different types of recruitment acts. Um, and yet another one, uh, workers grouped by the route by which workers arrived at the final nest, whether they went there independently or were followers or got transported. <clears throat> okay, so then we have a nice simulation model whose behavior corresponds to uh, that of an actual ant colony. So what good is that? What can you do with it? Well, you can make new predictions from it that uh, could be tested experimentally. And, <clears throat> and you, you could then uh, move on to try to actually analyze properties of the model's behavior. Okay, so... Uh, we made several predictions. Um, you could uh, see that colonies would make better decisions than individuals. You could evaluate the impact of quality differences among the candidate nests, which I think goes back to what Mike uh, was asking. Um, and the one I'm gonna uh, say a little bit more about now is the impact of the um, nest populations, the encountered nest populations on the speed and success of reaching uh, consensus. This is like uh, looking at how many ants you see in the nest and how does that uh, help you to um, reach consensus quickly or at all. Okay, so let's look at that. Um, so in, in our model, the decisions to move forward are mostly, prob are probabilis mostly probabilistic based on a sigmoid function, as I said. So what is this perceived nest quality? Well, uh, in previous work in the insect colony area, that was basically just some um, measure of, you know, how big the nest was, how small the opening was, physical uh, um, qualities of, um, of the nest. But we actually added something to that. We define X as a linear combination of physical nest quality. And we put in the number of ants that are currently in the nest. Okay, so we have um, some weighting factor for the population in the nest uh, plus the physical uh, nest quality. Okay, so now we have X uh, expanded into um, a physical quality and uh, something that depends on the population. So we discovered that biologists have apparently not uh, studied uh, this dependency. Um, we asked about that and they said, well, it's kind of experimentally challenging. Okay. Um, all right, so why did we decide to do this? Well, we kind of know from um, collective decision-making work, that positive feedback from peer opinion is uh, supposed to be important in collective decision-making. And we also knew that uh, in the algorithm I showed you before from uh, Mira Radeva's work, the algorithm too, uh, nest population was actually used in a, a very important way uh, to get robust, a robust house hunting algorithm. Okay, so this is a different from the use of thresholds where you change your behavior when you reach a certain quorum. But uh, this just says gradually, as you increase the population, you're going to increase your probability of moving the process along. Okay. Okay, so we did some simulation experiments uh, involving this use of this population coefficient. Um, we're looking at different values of the population coefficient to see what effect that they have on the emigration speed, which is basically one over the number of rounds uh, to reach convergence. And this is persistent convergence, meaning that almost all the ants wind up in a nest and stay there, okay? And then we also separately consider the effect of different values of the population coefficient on the success of consensus. Do you avoid splits? 
Okay. Okay. So uh, just one slide for each of these problems we considered. Uh, the population effect on immigration speed uh, turned out that when there's less noise, that's higher values of lambda, you get faster convergence. So we picked it apart to examine which values of the population coefficient work best with different values of lambda. And there's a chart. Um, intuitively, higher values of the population coefficient would tend to accelerate uh, the emigration, you, um, amplify the effect of uh, having some ants already in the nest, but it might also amplify a bad choice, which the colony might later uh, discover, and then they would be switching back to the better nest, and that could cause a delay. Okay, so our results, the simulation results, show that each particular value of lambda has an optimal value of the population coefficient. And it seems to peak around um, 0.2 of the population. Okay. And then we looked at the population. So we thought that was an interesting result and maybe the um, biologists can do something uh, to test that. Um, somewhat less interesting is the population effect on avoiding splits. Um, Intuitively, a higher population coefficient might help to prevent splits by amplifying initial choices between the candidate sites. Um, but our results show that uh, the system does very well uh, in avoiding splits even without the population effect. The population effect does improve the situation, but only a little. Uh, well, it's already so good that it's hard to improve it by a lot. So it appears the quorum rule alone does a very good job of preventing splits, but the population effect still helps. Okay, so summary here. So we have a, a math model, distributed algorithm style, specialized. So we, we wrote it as a general model, which could be used for other algorithms. We specialized that to the house hunting algorithm for thorax ants, developed a simulator, validated it against experimental work, explored a wide range of behaviors and got some new predictions about real ant colony behavior. Okay, so the other predictions are listed at the bottom, but I didn't go into the details. So for future work, uh, this does suggest some things biologists might do to verify predictions experimentally. Um, we could certainly do additional simulation studies. Um, be interesting to determine a general relationship between the nest the pattern of nest quality differences and the speed of convergence. I think this again speaks to uh, Mike's question. There's still work to be done here. Um, we haven't done anything much to bound the frequency of splits, the cost of repairing them. There's more that could be done there. And uh, for this community, you might want to consider uh, self-stabilization. What if you put the ants in some arbitrary state? Uh, will they gravitate back toward a good state where they're all in one nest? So that certainly is something to study. We didn't get to that. Okay, uh, but something we're continuing to work on is now, um, so we, we haven't actually modeled the geometry of, of the, uh, the system in any meaningful way. So now we're working on enhancing the model to include features of uh, actual location, geometric locations of, of the nests. I mean, you're more likely to find something that's closer. Um, and you could adapt the, the model and the simulator to study other insect algorithms and work on analysis. Okay. Questions about the, uh, that work? I'm just gonna move on. Um, spend a little time talking about our current work on analysis. Hi, Nancy, I have a quick question. Uh, in um, comparing- Is this Alex? Where yes, are you? Okay. Alex. Yeah. In comparing simulations to, uh, to ant behavior, um, was there any attempt to uh, determine the duration of, a, of an actual round um, in that? And also, uh, how are the sizes of colonies estimated, the, the real colonies? Oh, the real, the size, the second question, I guess, is, is easier. That's, um, it's just known. I mean, these colonies are a few hundred in size, and the insect biologists have pretty good knowledge of that. Um, the first question is about the synchrony model. About the duration um, of a round. Yeah, I think the things that we tested don't actually 
I mean, we don't compare it at the level of uh, round uh, duration. Oh, we, we basically compared it in terms of amount of time. I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. uh, we're measuring our time in rounds and they're measuring it in clock time. So yeah, we had to work out some comparison, but I don't know offhand what the, okay. um, the, the duration of a round, what, what we used. Okay, thank you. If Jaja is here, she might answer. I don't know. Okay. I, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, what yeah. was the okay. question? Oh, the question was what, uh, in making comparisons of your, um, th your simulation model, which is uh -huh. round based, with real experimental um, results, how do we um, match up the number of rounds with the amount of time? I mean, how long oh. is a round in reality? Um, we think that a round is generally uh, around a minute. So um, there are actions that take longer or shorter. So this is for sure an estimate for um, the ease of the simulation and analysis work later. Um, but I think it's a very important extension work um, to incorporate the timing aspects of different actions. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So in time that's left, I'll say a little bit about the um, analysis work. Okay. So can we analyze this algorithm? Well, there's an awful lot going on, uh, but we have uh, two newer projects. Um, one I'm going to summarize briefly, and one is the subject of Jaja's talk, which follows next in this conference. Okay, so the first project is by um, uh, Jaja. Uh, the main author is Emily Zhang. Um, this is on um, an upper and lower bound for the convergence time of house hunting in uh, temnothorax ant colonies. Again, we had a preliminary version in BDA. And the latest, the full version is going to appear in JCB, Journal of Computational Biology. Okay, so this is a very simplified model, starting with a really simple case. It's derived directly from the full model that I just talked about um, with lots of simplifications. Uh, the ant state uh, consists of its internal state and the location, um, which I think is the same as in the general model. Uh, simplification, we short-circuited some of the transitions, reduced the number of states, simplified some of the rules for how the ants change locations, but we think that it maintained the essential behavior. So here's a simplified version of the model. And now I'm just going to flash some uh, slides with the parameters that we considered, the quality population coefficient, the quorum threshold, and various uh, constants, k-nests in general, um, and we use bioplausible values of all the parameters. Okay, the probabilities, that's a little more complicated. Notice that there's one that isn't probabilistic and this is the transition involving sensing the quorum. The rest is all probabilistic. So we assume ants begin uh, in the state at nest. This is the um, original nest. Um, and every round the ant decides whether to advance or stay where it is. And these are the probabilities of advancing. Okay, um, this is just the algorithm code, uh, which basically just says you iterate through the ants, letting each one take a step. And if a step involves another ant, the transition counts as that rounds transition for both of the ants. So this comes from the other uh, paper. Okay, for the lower bound, uh, this was inspired by uh, the earlier work, the earlier lower bound that I mentioned by uh, Mira Radeva and co-authors. But this one actually talks about our specific algorithm, how long it takes rather than a general class of algorithms. Again, the result says it requires uh, log n rounds to converge with high probability. So it's the same bound as in the other paper, but it turns out it needs a new proof. Uh, we can't prove this lemma that I showed you before about any individual ant that's ignorant at the start of a round uh, has probability at least a quarter of remaining ignorant at the end of the round. But we did prove a weaker version, which turns out to be enough. The new lemma, lemma says, in the case where the number of ignorant passive ants in nest zero at the start of a round is at least this much, then any ignorant passive ant remains ignorant at the end of the round with a certain probability. So it's similar, but it has some extra conditions on it, but that turns out to be enough uh, to get the, the theorem. 
Okay, and then to do upper bound analysis, we just started and we're only looking at the time to emigrate to a single new nest rather than uh, modeling the com competitive part of the problem. Uh, the main theorem um, just talks about uh, if the quorum threshold is within certain bounds, then the expected time, this is not a high probability result, it's an expected time result uh, that says it's order log n. Um, so this is a random variable giving the number of rounds uh, for enough active ants and all the passive nest ants to move to the, the new nest. Okay, that's the theorem statement. So these are uh, reasonable uh, assumptions about the parameters. And uh, I'll just say uh, that you can look at the details of the proof in the paper, but it breaks down to two phases, the active ant immigration and then the transporting phase where you transport the passive ants and the brood. The expected time for active ant immigration turns out to be very fast, um, but then just transporting all the remaining ants uh, is where you get the log n behavior. Okay, so summary here, we simplified the model somewhat to make it easier to analyze. And a very special case of one candidate new nest, you can prove an expected time upper bound. So this at least demonstrates that analysis of this kind is feasible um, on special case models at least, but we're trying to extend that. In future work, we're looking to extend the bound we have to a uh, high probability, not just expected time, and consider multiple nests. There's a more general problem of, of understanding the dependence of uh, the results on the pattern of nest qualities, and then, um, to test the uh, observations in ant experiments. Okay, so we're pretty much uh, out of time. So good, so I've described our work on ant colony house hunting, the, starting with a simple theoretical model, a uh, more elaborate model uh, that matches up with biology. Um, there is a recent extension where we're looking at the uh, geometry of, of the uh, uh, algorithm. And then we looked at uh, analysis results using the special case, and then the new analysis results that will follow this talk, uh, more analysis that uh, we're working on at this time. So just to um, reiterate this approach, uh, how do you approach biological algorithms? Well, you learn a lot about the biological system, you extract from it um, toy abstract versions, and um, you can analyze that and get upper and lower bound results and get, some, get a good feeling for the algorithms, but then work with the biologists to develop much more realistic versions. But our part of the work from this community is to make these models mathematically precise, put them on a good sort of distributed algorithms foundation. Once we have the model, start out by simulating, validating, predicting, suggesting experiments, and then go back into the theory, seeing what observations can be proved. So I think this is promising for future work on ant colony algorithms, as well as other kinds of biological distributed algorithms. And thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Let, let us all thank the speaker. And we have time maybe for uh, one or two quick questions. Um. Hi, um, Nancy. Thank yes. you. Yes, who, who is this? Bernadette, I'm sorry. Bernadette. Okay. If um, you turn your camera on, I guess you'll jump to the top of my thumbnails of pictures. There you are. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a, a very um, elementary uh, question. Uh, are there some connection between your, your work, your, your result, and uh, the approach? Uh, developed uh, by uh, uh, Bernard Chazelle about uh, influence systems uh, based on, uh, in fact, uh, weighted averaging algorithms. I haven't read that. I've seen some of his earlier work. I'm sorry, but I, I'm, maybe you can send me a pointer. Okay. I don't know his work on influence systems. It, was it specifically about bi biological systems or just um, yeah. 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 making? Okay biological and also physical system because in fact it's uh, uh, the, the point is uh, is to 
to understand synchronization in natural system mm -hmm. uh, based on uh, some uh, uh, very um, very simple um, algorithm uh, which are in fact uh, weighted averaging algorithm which uh, because of oh, okay. uh, product of uh, stochastic matrices you can show that uh, they converge to to consensus so you achieve because i think that when you are mentioning consensus you mean that uh, uh, an ant is not aware that consensus is reached um well they they know when uh, a quorum exists in the nest which is essentially what determines the decision uh, but I don't know that the ant actually detects when all the ants are now in the nest. They may. Okay. Okay. Thanks. If there's a point at which maybe it's like, you know, when bivalence goes to univalence, right? When you, you uh, determine the choice, and that is for an ant, uh, when they see a quorum there, they know that this is going to be the final. I mean, this is all approximate, right? And noisy. So no is uh, it's a, it's it's taken with a grain of salt, but yes. Um, okay. Yeah, so there's a decision point based on quorums, and then there's the final point when everybody's still already there. And okay. I, I don't know any work about detecting that, but please do send the uh, pointer or um, email, or I don't know how to get it to other people. I can send it uh, to you in, in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, so we're now uh, out of time. So um, let us thank the speaker one more time. Thank you, Nancy.